Hi guys, it's Adam, and welcome to the Reselling Rebels podcast. I believe this is episode 5. So, in today's podcast, we are going to be discussing building a reselling business from the ground up. Now, as you might imagine, I have got a lot of notes on this one. I've also had a couple of comments over on Instagram. I've almost got two full pages worth of notes here. So, of course, this one's probably going to be a little bit longer than the ones in the past. But obviously, that may be better for you guys. as You might be able to do a little bit of a longer listing session while you're listening to this podcast. So, yeah, this is a big topic. Um... I would say that this isn't going to be an exhaustive list of all the things that you can possibly do to build a resign business at the start. Obviously, there's going to be a few things that I'll have missed out, but I've tried to include include as much as possible, as many tips as possible, um, as many things that I did that I thought were positives, as many things that I did that obviously were negatives. Obviously, I'm going to Uh, maybe slightly ramble a little bit on certain points about my own experience having obviously been through uh, building a reselling business from the ground up and uh, essentially hopefully what this uh, podcast will provide is a reference point for any new resellers um, in which they can listen to this podcast as they're starting and uh, they may get a few tips from it, and they may find this a little bit of of a sort of guide or at least some sort of direction, give them some sort of direction um, as they are starting. So next week's uh, episode will be centered around backlogs, sticky stock, and optimum inventory. So I think that's quite an interesting topic, just the same as this week. So uh, it's quite nice that we've got a couple of interesting topics over the next couple of weeks. So with that being said, let's get on with the first point. So first off, I just wanted to say, don't be hesitant. Start as soon as you can and do what needs to be done. So a lot of people, uh, I get a lot of questions on my videos, on Insta, you know, all the time of people saying, how do I do this? How do I do the other? How do I do this? How do I do the other? All all the time. And it's not necessarily that it's a bad thing to ask a question. However, I always do feel that um, the right people ask the right questions. And what I mean by this is the people who are going to really excel in reselling are only going to ask questions when they really need to. And the majority of things, they're just going to press on with themselves and uh, essentially jump over those hurdles themselves. So, you know, I get a lot of questions around, uh, you know, how do I register as a business? How do I set up an eBay account? How do I go about doing this? How, you know, do I need to see an accountant or don't I need to see an accountant and stuff? And yes, granted, a few of those questions are fairly okay, you know, they're fairly okay questions, but if you did a little bit of research on uh, YouTube surrounding business and maybe even reselling in general, even on this channel actually, I've got videos centered around a few of those things mentioned, um, you will find all the information you need without even any anyone's help essentially. So therefore you can take the control and the responsibility into your own hands and uh, essentially get your business set up ASAP. So, of course, as I mentioned, I've actually got a tutorial video on my channel on how to register as a business with HMRC within the UK. Um, And, you know, things like setting up eBay accounts, they're very, very easy to do. Uh, You know, as I say, there's there's tutorials on them as well. I've not specifically got a tutorial on my channel of setting up an eBay account from, from sort of straight away, kind of actually registering. But registering for accounts these days is so easy it's so simple um and then you know with the accountant question that's a little bit more of a valid question and i understand that a lot of people will be confused whether they do need an accountant how are they going to do their accounts all that sort of stuff but again with a little bit of research with you know maybe a little bit of uh, digging around on the internet 
you can soon start to understand what you need to do, what HMRC requires you to do, the information they require you to keep, all the rest of it. And I think it's the gov.co.uk website um, that there's loads of help sheets on. So it tells you directly what sort of things HMRC are looking for, what documents and what information they need you to keep in order to obviously run the business, maintain the business, and then obviously submit your tax returns and things like that. So, you know, it's not it's not incredibly hard. Also, I've wrote down here uh, another of the things that uh, sort of people ask or people um, seem to be hesitant, hesitant upon is where to find stock and where's it, where's it best to find stock and where can I find stock of a certain niche so for example where can I find more antiques opposed to maybe where can I find more toys but again all this information especially that last one there as I've covered is available on eBay e uh, sorry on YouTube not eBay and it particularly is available on my channel as well you know you see you can even pick up pick this information up indirectly through my haul videos so when I show you an auction haul you can see that I'm getting quite a lot of antiques so you know you can put two and one and two one and two together or two and two together I think it's you can put two and two together and you can realize that oh well he must be getting a lot of antiques from auctions so auctions are a place to go to to get more antiques and then all you need to do is simply go on google and you know find uh, where your local auction houses are see what sort of products there they kind of that are going through the auction house so for some auctions it might be more generalist stuff for other auctions it might be more antiques so just choose your kind of uh, way there and obviously there's car boots and charity shops and all the rest of it so yeah as i say all this information can be found um you know on youtube in tutorials or, or, or a vast majority of it can be it can certainly all be found on the internet somewhere so um yeah don't be try not to be too hesitant just get going get stuck in that's what i did i wasn't messing about i didn't really even mess it well i didn't really know anyone any other resellers at the time because i had joined the facebook group the uk reselling group at the time but I didn't really know on it, anyone on there, so it was kind of that I had to do it myself anyway. And then I started to get to know people a bit, and a few people kind of, I, I wouldn't say took me under their wing, but I kind of uh, made friends with them and, and was able to ask them a few different bits and bobs of questions and stuff. So, um, yeah, just don't be hesitant, get started. Um, and I'm, I'm going to come on to... A point actually I think it's one of the comments that we've got at the end about starting selling your own stuff opposed to just starting to sell stuff that you've bought specifically to resell straight away but yeah just just get some ground in and get started as soon as you can that's the first point so the next one is be careful or be wary of cash flow uh, this has been somewhat a hard lesson for me at times now as I was growing the business, um, or not necessarily growing it, but in, in a period of, it wasn't necessarily the, the starting period, but kind of when I was about one and a half, two years in, which you could still say that's fairly, you know, fairly new business. Um, but when I was about, you know, one and a half, two years in, I actually started to really master my, my cash flow and I was better at it. And then, you know, I've had periods, I'm suffering a period at the moment where my cash flow is a little bit more restricted. Um, so obviously I've got to be wary of that again, but I've faced this many times in the past. So I, I, I know a little bit more of what to do these days. But I, I did master it for quite a while and I was able to keep a good cash reserve in place. And, uh, you know, at the start of the business, it's kind of the tendency of some individuals to think, oh, I'm making a little bit of money here. Um, you know, and they don't necessarily reinvest all of it back into the business. It is my um, view or understanding that you should reinvest as much as you possibly can. Now, I think I wrote down here somewhere. Um, yeah, I think I wrote down something similar to the idea that, ah, here we go. Take only the money you tr truly need out of the business. So, essentially... If you need some money for bills, if there's something you need money for, like, you know, you absolutely need money for, then yes, you've got to take it out of the business, but only take the money you truly need out of the business. And for the first 
I would say 12 months really, you want to be reinvesting, reinvesting, reinvesting to a very, very high degree, possibly even the first 18 months, something like that to a very, very high degree. Some people would argue a little bit less than that, uh, maybe, you know, first six months, something like that. And then maybe others would argue a little bit longer than that. Um, I, I think as I got to about the 18 month mark, I was reinvesting less and I was able to take out a little bit more. But the fundamental problem that or mistake I made was that I started really getting into Lego for I was I was reselling Lego as well. But the problem was I was reselling Lego and that had given me a little bit of a bug for building Lego. And so I started buying brand new sets off Lego Shop at home, not to resell, but for myself. And as we all know, buying brand new Lego is pretty expensive. So I was starting buying these Lego sets for myself with the money that I've, I've gained from my business, essentially. And that was not helping, especially because that was probably about 12 months in, something like that. Um, it wasn't particularly helping too much. So I identified that, I realized what I had done wrong, and I corrected that. I'd stopped buying, uh, well, basically, I stopped buying Lego, to be honest, at one point, and, and started to... Uh, look into Lego investing opposed to buying it for myself to build. And I kind of had to sacrifice uh, building the sets that I wanted to build and stuff like that. I mean, I still build a few bits and bobs and I still built a few bits and bobs at the time. But um, mainly I thought, right, I'm going to transition and change this from a hobby into more of a business thing so that then I can still buy Lego and I can still have that enjoyment in that regard of actually buying it. Um, but obviously then I can make more money in the process with the Lego investing. Turned out to be a really, really good decision actually in the end. And last quarter four, or maybe, was it last quarter four or the quarter four before? No, it was last quarter four. Uh, I was doing really, really well with, with the sales of Lego and I invested in the majority of the right sets. There was a few sets that I made uh, mistakes on, but I invested in the majority of the right sets. And I kind of changed my situation from possibly a negative one that was draining from my business to a slightly more positive one that was adding to my business. So just make sure that you're not taking money out, you're not seeing this money come in your account and you're thinking, oh, well, I'll buy this nice new t-shirt or I'll buy this nice new handbag or what, you know, whatever it may be. I don't know what it might be for you. Uh, I've also wrote down here, the ideal situation for cash flow and building a business uh, to be in is to have a financial buffer of some sort of financial cushion. This could be in the form of maybe a spouse. So uh, maybe your spouse works full time. They obviously then with their income can pay a little bit more of the bills until your business is, is obviously growing and growing. And then you can contribute back to the bills fully. And, uh, you know, once your business is fully up and running, obviously, when I started my business, I was 19. So I was living at, I'm still living at home now, but I was living at home at the time. So obviously, my bills were irrelevant, really, they were, they were very, very mi minimal. Um, so therefore, I didn't need to worry about that so much. But now as I'm growing up, I'm starting to have a few more bills incorporated into my life. But that's not so bad at this point, because I've obviously built the business a little bit. So it's not as weak as it um, you know, was at the start, so it can take the bills a little bit more. So yeah, some sort of financial buffer, financial cushion, something like that. Uh, when I say financial buffer, financial cover, cushion, aren't quite the right words to use because that kind of is indicating that you have funds in a bank account somewhere as a financial buff buffer. I'm not necessarily meaning that. I can't quite think of the right word, but basically what I'm trying to elaborate is this kind of someone in your immediate family who can somewhat support the bills or whatever while you're building your business. That's that's the situation that, that is pretty good. Um, and then you can put the hard work in, you can be dedicated to your business. And obviously, then you can, as I say, start contributing to the bills. And even maybe at some point in the future, if your business is going really well, end up taking more of a portion um, of the bill paying to then kind of almost pay back or make equal what you were doing at the start when you weren't paying as many bills. I suppose that's what I'm trying to say. So yeah, so that's 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 one that you've got to be careful with. You've got to make sure that your cash flow 
is um, being looked at, is being observed, and is just fairly healthy. You could also, I've not wrote it down here, you could also do one of these PayPal working capitals, so then you can get a little bit of uh, an injection of cash flow, and then you can buy stock with that and then reinvest that money um, from the stock that sells into your business and then obviously pay off the PayPal working capital with a little bit of that sales value as well. So that's something you could do. If you're going to go down that route, obviously use all that money for stock. Don't be buying random things for yourself with that money. Um, it may be tempting to do if you get you know, a thousand pound, two thousand pound, three thousand pound, whatever from PayPal, but do not do that. Just focus on buying stock. Um, I've never had a PayPal working capital. I've thought about it quite a lot, but I've never really, I mean, to be honest, I, I'd say I mastered my cash flow a little bit, um, at maybe the two year mark, something like that, I believe I said. Um, and essentially that meant that I didn't necessarily need a lot of cash flow. I didn't need an injection of cash flow specifically. So next, what are we on here? Um, it may be needed to sacrifice some social time in the earlier days in order to really build up the business. But at the start, you will uh, love the new adventure so much that you will naturally want to do this. So essentially what I mean by this is at the start of any new business, there's a mountain of work and it, it's no different with reselling. So you have this mountain of work that you feel you need to do or that, well, basically you just need to do. Um, and essentially you've got to commit to that. You've got to realize that, hang on, it does take a little bit of work to build a business. You can do it slower. Uh, there are people out there who have done it a little bit slower. But then if you are going to build the business a little bit slower, you need, again, maybe a financial cushion of some sort. You need um, the ability to be able to do that. Um, and you need to have confidence in yourself that even though you are going slow with this business, it will slowly grow and things will, things will turn out. But generally, what I did and what a lot of people do is they sacrifice more of the social time. They put in a lot of work. They don't mind doing this because naturally they just enjoy reselling or whatever business it is. And uh, yeah, and, and then that's that basically. And they end up growing their business fairly quickly um, because they're putting in a lot of work. It, it you know, things, things are happening that are very positive for them. And uh, yeah, essentially that's that. So you might need to sacrifice a little bit of social time if uh, you are wanting to grow the business at a decent rate. As I say, you can also do, a, you know, you can grow it a little bit slower, but then obviously um, it's going to take longer to get, get it to where you want to be. So next we've got choose your platform and plan and then stick to it. So for example, this could be Amazon and books or eBay and antiques or Amazon and RA toys, eBay and generalist items, doesn't really matter. But essentially you want to choose, I would say, in my opinion, one platform and then a certain niche of items that you want to sell. So let's just take the example here of, I don't know, what's a good one? eBay and antiques, because that's the, the one I can relate to the most. So you, th you think, right, I want to do eBay. I'm not too bothered about Amazon yet. I've got Amazon in my kind of one eye, kind of like in my peripherals or in my in my future, I'm going to think about Amazon. But at the moment, I want to do eBay and antiques. That seems to be my thing, right? So you think to yourself, right, I'm going to stick to that now. How do I get antiques? Well, then you need to think about, well, you know, going to auctions or going around the car boots with the dealers and trying to get some antiques that way. You know, how am I going to, I don't know anything about antiques, so how am I going to learn and all the rest of it? So then you might want to buy yourself a few books, read up on a few things or, you know, go online and watch a few of haul videos from resellers who are doing antiques. Maybe watch Craig's Little... Craigslist Hunter and people like that who do deal in a fair few antiques as well as other items. But there's loads of people actually. A antiques Arena is another good one on uh, for the UK side of things. Um, so, you know, doing that, looking and learning uh, from other people, we sign antiques. And then essentially, um, you know, as I say, you then find the places to source these items and you start to go for it. 
and you put all your effort into that one platform and that one niche. Now, as I say, this could be anything. It could be the fact that you don't like antiques. That's perfectly fine. Go ahead and do Amazon and RA Toys or go ahead and do eBay and, as I say, generalist items or something. Whatever suits you. And in fact, if you want to get into, let's say, eBay and doing generalist items, so what I mean by that is just anything and everything, selling whatever kind of you feel like selling really uh, that's a lot broader and it's going to be a lot easier to start because you won't really need that much knowledge you can literally just go on ebay completing solds and find different items when it comes to antiques you can't always find them on ebay completing solds so sometimes you need a little bit added knowledge there or a little bit of a you know dealers call it you need a bit of the eye, you know, uh, the eye for actually picking out something of quality opposed to something that isn't quality. Um, so yeah, maybe it's your your will that you want to go ahead and do eBay and generalist items. But again, if that's the thing you choose, then go for it. Don't don't think about anything else. Um, focus your attention, focus your awareness on just eBay. And, and selling these generalist items, whatever it may be, whatever you can get your hands on, and wherever you can get your hands on it. Um, and, and then that's that. You just keep it to that. And uh, and th what this will do is it'll mean that you're not kind of uh, spreading yourself too thin or anything like that. But I don't want to touch on that too much because I'm going to talk about spreading yourself too thin in a little bit on the second page of these notes. So... Next, we have keep an eye on sales. If sales are slow, don't panic. Uh, this could be natural. So I've gone through, as you would probably imagine, in the four years I've been reselling, a lot of periods of slow sales. Sometimes they've been quite natural in terms of I've been listing quite consistently, but for whatever reason, it's a slow period of the year or... Um, you know, certain things are happening in the economic environment or whatever that slows down sales a bit, makes people a bit more cautious with buying things, uh, whatever it may be. There's tons of different reasons. Uh, it might be just the fact that the weather is really, really nice or people are going on, you know, it's a certain time of year where pe most people are going away on holidays. So there's less people browsing eBay, all that sort of stuff. Uh, so it could be natural. So don't worry. Take a few days, maybe even take a, a week or two to just think, right, OK, the, you know, sales are slow. Uh, but I'm not going to worry for a little bit yet. Um, but then after a few weeks, if sales are still slow, it might be the fact that it isn't just a you know a natural factor or what I would kind of term a natural factor, and it might be that it might be to do with something else. So what you may want to do is look at the things you can do to increase the sales. So you might want to, for one, actually have a, a runner sale in your eBay store. Your prices might be a little bit high. Uh, if you're a new reseller, the chances are you're either going to price things too low or too high. So it might be the fact that you've priced them a little bit too high and you need to maybe come down a little bit. Normally, it's the opposite with, with new resellers. It was the same for myself. I was pricing things too low and then I was getting really good sales. My sales were actually really, really good, but I was deceiving myself a little bit because I could have got a little bit more for the items. And that's always been my problem, to be honest. I still confront this problem a little bit, even at four years on, where sometimes I do just price things a little bit cheap and they go a little bit quick. But on the, on the whole now, I'm fairly okay with my pricing as i say there might be a couple of things here and there that price a little bit low but generally speaking I'm, I'm a little bit better with that now so you could also try selling something new if the particular items in that niche aren't working for you uh, you can change or upgrade the, the look of your photos and your listings. So what I mean by this is I say maybe upgrade your photo area and, uh, you know, maybe you've not got a dedicated photo area. You want to upgrade your photo area to a nice white background or something like that. Um, and then obviously upgrade your titles. Make sure you're packing them out with more keywords, um, you know, just really filling out those titles with with as many words as possible to trigger searches so that then people will actually find your item um, and then essentially 
that may help improve your sales because the look of your listings, the quality of your listings has improved as well. Um, and actually, I just wanted to note as well, um, at the end of this kind of point, I actually have videos on this. So I have uh, a playlist on my YouTube channel. It's entitled eBay Courses. If you go in the playlist section of my YouTube channel, it should be one of the little, uh, or what do you call them? one of the little tabs on my YouTube channel and you should be able to find a playlist called eBay courses and I've got loads of help in there as well so you don't need to worry you can simply just go over there and obviously find a little bit more help and a little bit more detail with regards to some of the things I'm saying in this podcast. So uh, next one we are just turning on to the second page now so that's pretty pretty decent we're on 25 minutes I think. Uh, don't worry about future challenges. So just take them as they come, focus on what you are doing now, enjoy it, and then move on to the next job. So I hear, and I know Nick's touched upon this actually, that he's got quite a few comments like this. Uh, people saying, you know, I'm, I'm worried about packaging things, or I'm worried about returns, or I'm worried about this, or I'm worried about that. Well, well, just think about what you're saying really there. You're worrying about something that isn't even here. Literally, you're worrying about something that hasn't even happened yet. It doesn't even exist. You may not even get a return on the item that you're thinking you're going to get a return on. So don't make, you, don't make more problems for yourself by thinking about what can happen in the future. Just focus on... The things that you're doing now, the items that you're listing on this current day or the, the items that you're packaging on this current day, get them out, get everything sorted that you need to today and then tomorrow's another day. You know, if, if there's problems that you encounter tomorrow, just encounter them as they come. Don't think, don't start, don't start projecting out into the future and thinking to yourself, oh, well, you know, this will probably happen and this will probably happen. That is the quickest way to basically quitting a business and thinking, oh, well, it's too hard for me, I can't do it. And and you basically, you may end up quitting your business from um, viewing it as, a, as, as problems that haven't even arisen yet. So essentially, you're going to quit from nothing, from, from a pointless viewpoint, because you're basically quitting out of fear, which doesn't even really exist in the current moment because the things that are giving you that fear don't exist yet. They're just a, an imaginary force, essentially. You're, you're essentially projecting out and thinking that they're going to become a reality and therefore that's giving you more fear, more anxiety and stuff like that. So don't think too much about the future. Focus on the jobs at hand. The problems, I'm sure there'll be some that do end up coming. I don't know what they are, um, but I'm sure there'll be some that en will end up coming for you. Um, but don't think about them because what's the point? You know, Some of them might not ever come, as I say. Um, so yeah, don't worry about them too much. Things are going to happen in the way they're going to happen. Just deal with the things as they come along. And that's that, essentially. Um, so work out, this is the next point, work out whether you'd like to buy in packaging materials or find them for free. Free materials might be better at first so that then you don't waste cash flow. So I have another video course on this within the eBay courses playlist of how you can get free packaging. You know, you can go to places like um, supermarkets and places like Quality Saver quite good for me. And uh, you just go down there, ask, obviously, if you could have some of the boxes that they're not using, the cardboard ones, and then you can get some free boxes. It's a win-win. Because, obviously, they're just going to end up scrapping them and stuff anyway, or recycling them or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's a win-win, really. You're taking some of that off their hands, and, obviously, then you are able to get some free packaging. Now, I know some people like to say about how, uh, you know, they buy boxes because it's a more professional look and I get that standpoint now personally I don't think touch wood but personally I don't think I've ever had anyone say uh, even if I've sent things out in you know with with boxes that have sweet labelings around them or whatever it may be or crisp labelings or wh whatever it may be I've never had anyone say 
oh, that packaging was very, very unprofessional. You should be packaging in uh, boxes that don't have any printing on the side of them or anything. I've never had anyone say that. So I think this professionalism thing is just people thinking um, it it needs to happen. I don't I don't think actually customers really care. I think that there are customers out there that care, but they are in the the vast minority. And therefore, is it worth you buying the packaging materials just because you've got a little bit of that fear in your mind that oh well someone might say it's unprofessional or, or whatever. Now, if you're if you have a wholesale reselling business, well, it's not really a reselling business, but if you have a wholesale business on eBay, then I would advise quite strongly that you buy boxes, not only because you're obviously going to be selling more volume and it's going to take a lot more time to end up sourcing boxes for free, but because people who buy wholesale specifically, or sorry, people who buy new items specifically, which is what you're going to be selling if you're a wholesaler, uh, sorry, if you're selling wholesale, uh, they expect more professionalism in the quality of the, the packaging. They expect a, a box that isn't secondhand, that hasn't been used before or anything. They expect a box that is either got some branding of the company that they're buying off on it, or just simply no branding on it. So in that respect, I would say if you're wholesale, definitely buy in boxes. And of course, you'll need to for the ease of it, um, because you're going to be selling so much volume, as I say. Now, um, I buy boxes, but the only way I buy boxes or certain bits of packaging material is with my eBay voucher. So sometimes I'll spend a little bit more than my eBay voucher that I get every month with my featured store. Um, but generally, I won't be spending a lot of money on those packaging materials because I get my £10 off. So that's the only real real way that I buy boxes. And then obviously you get a bit of un uniformity there because... Um, you know, the eBay branded boxes are nice and professional, etc. Um, but generally, I just go down to Quality Save, get me boxes from there. Obviously, I buy other things like bubble wrap. You know, you can't really avoid certain things. I know there are places that you may be able to get bubble wrap. I've not yet to find a sustainable location in my local area that will provide me with bubble wrap. I'm sure there are ones around. I've not really done too much digging, so I definitely need to look into that. But yeah, first off, I would say just recapping on this, get find the boxes and your, as much packaging material for free as you can because all you're going to be doing if you buy them first off is you're just going to be tying up more and more cash um, or not necessarily tying it up but actually wasting it, actually going out and then you, you know you end up having to keep buying the boxes and stuff. Um, you can find them for free. And that means that you're going to save yourself possibly even an extra 20, 30, 40 quid a month, something like that, depending on how many boxes and stuff you're going to be using. So definitely where you can find it for free. That is my tip. And then if you want to have a more professional look, once you're up and running with your business properly after a year or two, then you can make the decision to buy boxes if it's so your wish. So anyway... Next comment here or next uh, point I've got. If you aren't enjoying the plan you have set uh, that you have set up after a few months, then you need to change it. Um, and you maybe want to give it a good a good while before you change it. So if you've got this plan that you've set up, let's say we, you know we go back to the idea that you want to sell eBay and uh, you know you want to sell on eBay and you want to sell antiques then of course you want to give it a good amount of time you don't just want to just abandon the plan after a few weeks or anything you want to give it a couple you know i'd say free uh, you know what, well you know what i did i changed up my business uh early was it early 2018 and i gave this plan that i wanted to do around three to six months and then i realized at that point it wasn't particularly working in the way i wanted it to so then i changed uh, I changed again actually I didn't change back to what I was doing but I changed again to a slightly different plan uh, that is now working a little bit better for me um, in terms of the quality of items I'm able to pick up so you know you want to give it a bit of time I'd say around three months is a, is a good time maybe a little bit longer um, but around that sort of time and uh, if you realize that you aren't enjoying it after that time after that say first three months or so then change it 
don't stick to doing something you're not enjoying because it's not going to work out for you. I've actually had about four, maybe, maybe, maybe four major changes in my business. One major change was going from selling, uh, basically I started to sell generalist items and board games and stuff like that and, and books to then selling mainly Lego and I was doing a lot of Lego, pretty much mainly Lego for quite a while. Then I changed over, oh yeah, I forgot about this, I changed over to doing pretty much solely video games on Amazon FBA and I did that for about six months. And then I changed over to doing um, basically household items and maybe a few collectibles and antiques in there from a lower quality auction house and then I changed again to the method I'm at now which is buying uh, job lots from a slightly better auction house, slightly more upmarket auction house and uh, essentially being able to get a, a better standard and better quality of items. So you will have in your business periods in which you have to keep changing you have to go from one thing to another to another and even I'm at another uh, pivotal point in my changing of my my business because I've, I've, I've realized that I need to start buying a few more toys because the antiques are brilliant but they are slightly slower sellers so I need to either buy m more market antiques so that then obviously when I get a sale I'm getting, you know, a 50 to 100 pound sale and I don't need to sell as many of them. And that, that means, of course, I don't need to package as much. But also, I decided that I want to go back into the toys a little bit more because I, I realise I enjoy that as well as the antiques. Um, and that also gives me a, a better sell-through rate. So again, I'm at another changing point right now. So you may always be at these changing points. It may always flow like this. You might, you might not last about six months or so in one period of your business you may always change and flow with different different ways of doing things and different um things that you're selling so yeah so you want to be able to give it a fair chance the the method that you've gone down first off but then you want to cut it off when you feel necessary and just change it and and start selling items that are more you that are um, maybe more enjoyable for you to sell. Maybe you've started off selling something that you thought would be enjoyable for you. You thought that the niche that you went into would be really, really good for you, and it just wasn't. And then, obviously, you've decided to essentially just change over. And this is always a part of the journey. You've just got to do this, and you've got to try until you get it right. I've actually wrote down here probability is that you won't get it right first time and you will have to change to selling items that more suit you so yeah and i would say that's pretty accurate some people might get it first time they might go into the niche that they love and they might stay in that niche forever they might think right well uh, and a good thing is to look at your hobbies so let's say you've been a gamer for 15 years of your life let's say you're what 25 now something i, I don't know i mean I know the average age of my audience, I think, is around 25 to 34 or something. So, or it might be 35 to 44. I'm not sure. Something like that, anyway. But let's say, well, let's say you're 30 now to, to try and appeal to the demographic that, that I obviously have on this channel. So, let's say you're 30 now. You've been a gamer for 15 years. You started at 15. You, you've loved gaming and you've decided to get into resign. Well, a good bet of what you will want to sell is gaming items because for one you know what gaming's like you love it you, you probably will find it very very easy to test the items and test the consoles and games and stuff um and you know you, you just know it you just know it and you just love it so therefore it will be easier for you so if you look at the hobbies that you have that may indicate what the thing the niche is the, the the items are that you're going to love selling the most and then you may well get it right first time and you may well just stick in one niche for for a very long period of time but i think there's always going to be times where you end up selling different items um even if let's like, say you really love video games you might sell video games for the first couple of years but then you might kind of restrict them a little bit and maybe want to get into a few other areas anyway because selling in the same niche can get a little bit boring um a little bit mundane after a while so or at least it can do for me i don't know it might not be as much uh, for other people but yeah um so that's one way you can do it obviously for me 
I used to always love watching Flog It and Bargain Hunt, and I used to watch it multiple times a week after school around my grandparents' house when I would go round, and, and therefore, obviously, that gave me a bit of a, um, a passion for collectibles and things like that, and that's why I tend to seem to sell them quite easily. You know, I don't, I don't really have much... Uh, fuss with listing them you know I seem to be able to list them quite easily Um, it's not something that is a struggle for me to list and I think the good thing about collectibles antiques things like that is that a lot of them are different so you're not you know you might be coming across a standard bread and butter stuff but a lot of them are also different as well so it's you know, when you come to listing them, you're always going to be listing a few different items. So that's a nice thing as well with, with the realm of antiques and collectibles. And the higher market you go uh, with antiques and collectibles, the the more oddities and different items you will find. Because the more rare something is, the more different and, un- and unusual it is normally is the case. So... Therefore, that gives you more passion because you're really starting to sell different items and and even though you're in the same niche, it feels very fresh to you because you're still selling different items. So yeah, anyway, that's that one. So next, I put add extras to your business only when the time is right. Don't spread yourself too thin in the early days. If you want to do side projects, ensure your main platform or business is doing well first. So obviously this relates a little bit to me saying about choose your platform and plan and then stick to it. So of course, you know, you might have in your peripherals, like I said, or you might have one eye on the, on the fu- in the future on let's say Amazon and maybe you're doing eBay right now and you've got one eye in the future at Amazon and you're thinking, right, I do think I'm going to do Amazon, but but let's just stick to eBay for now. Let's just build that up, etc. That's a good way to go. Don't think to yourself, right, I'm going to, I'm, I'm getting into this resign. Right, I'm going to do eBay. I'm going to do Amazon. I'm going to set up an Etsy shop at the same time. I'm going to do, I'm going to share my journey on YouTube. I'm going to set up an Instagram account so then I can communicate to other resellers, like, you know, other like-minded people and stuff, other business owners. And I might even set up a business Instagram account aside from that to start promoting my listings or something. And then I'm going to create this brand and then I'm going to create another thing. That is completely, in my opinion, the wrong attitude to it um what i did um was i went down the route of ebay focused on that for a while and then i think it was about six to eight months in which is a little bit soon to be honest but my personality tends to i'm quite bad for this really i don't really practice what i preach here um but i'll be honest when i say that you know i am it's because of my personality i sometimes tend to jump the gun a little bit and I do spread myself a little bit too thin. Um, but because I have spread myself too thin in the past, I can identify the weaknesses in that, and therefore I can pass on some better information to other people. So because of my own failures, essentially, I've been able to um, understand what a good way of going about this would be. So as I say, about six, eight months in to my resign, I wanted to do Amazon, so I then... Uh, added Amazon into the game and it turned out it was an okay decision to be honest but really you might want to wait a little bit longer than that it might be a little bit longer period you might want to build up your eBay or build up your your main platform first a little bit more than than jumping the gun a little bit but again it, it depends on your own personality I mean if you're one of those people who really just needs to do have side projects or needs to do something else it might be okay to kind of slowly incorporate one of those into your business but i would still say wait a little bit until your main platform's built up to a fairly decent level and also if you are integrating these things make sure that your time management is on point make sure that you're not spending too much time on the side project because the side project is uh, a dream an ideal the main business is the uh, reality so is what you're making your main income on. The the reality of the side project could be in the future that it ends up making you a lot of money. But right now, it doesn't make you any money. So you've got to realize that and you've got to put the 
the main focus where the money is. So you've got to put more money, uh, more time, sorry, into your main business with the, with a slight focus on this side project. And again, I realized this from my own folly of putting a little bit too much time into the side projects and not enough time into my main business. So again, that's why I can kind of ident identify that as maybe a more correct way of doing it. Um, opposed to, as I say, putting more time into the side projects like I did. So, yeah, just make sure you get some good, solid foundation with your, your main business, your main platform first off before uh, being tempted in by other other projects, kind of like um, not really a siren because that gives the illusion that the project isn't going to work out but it's kind of like some sort of temptress is tempting you in with these side projects sometimes so you just got to be aware of that a little bit and 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 don't give in to too much of that temptation make sure you keep your focus where where the money is so yeah that's that one there anyway and then final couple of points now before we get on and do a couple of comments so uh, next one is give yourself firm but fair goals, possibly in terms of income or sales. Now, I wanted to point out here, not necessarily in number of listings. The amount of listings you have means nothing if you are not selling anything. So, you know, it's brilliant. All these people saying, oh, well, uh, you know, I've got a thousand listings on eBay. I've got, you know, 1,500. I've got 500 listings, whatever. And all these new resellers come in and think, oh, yeah, I want, I want a thousand items on eBay. And, and I did this. I was exactly I was exactly this. I come in, oh, yeah, that person's got 600. That person's got a thousand. I want that. I want that. I want that. And again, that comes into comparison a little bit, comparing yourself unfavorably to others like we discussed in the, I think it was episode two, was it? Or episode three? Um so if you haven't checked out that podcast, go back because that might be quite interesting for you. Um, but, you know, new retailers come in and we do this and we yeah, I want that amount of listings. But you see what we do when we do that and we think to ourselves, well, I'm going to get this quantity of listings is we sacrifice or we can end up sacrificing a little bit of quality. And people are just like, yeah, let's get as many listings on as possible. I think a new reseller should be disciplined um, you know, not necessarily say that they have uh, a master or someone who is, um, you know, kind of taking control of their journey or anything, but they should be disciplined maybe by their, by their own doing or maybe by someone just helping them along a little bit, or taking them under their wing a little bit. And they need to think to themselves, right, what's better? A thousand listings of which have terrible photos have five, you know, f three, four, five words in the title um, that have, you know, I don't know, poor pricing because they've not done much research and stuff, or some incredibly good quality photos, a title that uses up all the characters with loads of different keywords, some good pricing because you've done some valid research beforehand. And, you know, maybe a smaller amount of items or it maybe takes you longer to get up to the 500 or the 1,000. But that is much better, in my opinion, than a 1,000 or 1,500 listings where things were a little bit off. I mean, I'll tell you right now, I'll be honest, a lot, of, well, I say a lot of my listings, probably about three, 400 of the earlier listings that I've had, had on for maybe two years or so, um you know, aren't as good, aren't as good as they can be. Uh, a lot of the ones over the last 12 months or so are much better. Obviously, I've improved my photo area and things like that. And I've, I've made multiple changes to my photo area. Um, and I've never, for probably the first two years of my reselling, I was never satisfied with my photo area. And therefore, the listings that are still on from that period um, just don't do my store justice really and it means that although I've got 1400 listings we can scrap quite a lot of them as being not necessarily dead but maybe some of them are sticky still some of them uh, you know don't have as, as good a quality photos as they could do all the rest of it so it is important I think someone should be disciplined to get a photo area to um, you know to get a good photo area to get a good um, set up with your with your keywords and stuff, 
and to to really ground themselves in some pricing. In fact, I've I always uh, it's funny I'm talking about this now. Um, I would really it, it interests me massively. Uh, because of the knowledge I've learned with this and the knowledge I continually learn because I'm still learning just like everyone else. But I would really like to, uh, if I if I had the time to do this, if I essentially if I could gain some level of financial independence from uh, my investments or whatever that I've got going, um, I would love to spend part of my time actually voluntarily um, cultivating a new reseller. So what I mean by that is actually someone who's in the local area let's say i go around their house two days a week or whatever for the first six months or year of their reselling journey and i am I, I become almost like their kind of um figure of light in one way in the sense of oh well i made a mistake doing this so maybe you might want to avoid this and you know what i mean and and really cultivate a very very strong and professional reseller from all the mistakes that i made and i think that with a good bit of, you know, a, a good few notes and stuff and writing down of a few things and really trying to help that person and really trying to get to know that person, I could really cultivate a, a good, strong reseller out of that. But I don't know, maybe that's my tendency of, of enjoying psychology and, and so maybe I'm, I'm trying to cultivate a, a stronger person psychologically rather than a, a stronger reseller i'm not sure maybe it's just my tendency to to be like that but yeah uh, that would be something quite interesting to do actually i'd love to do that but i don't have i can't spend two days out of my week doing that because i need to earn money right and therefore so with these investments that i've got if they end up working out i'll have i'll be able to actually reduce the hours i put in with my main business and I can do things like that voluntarily. I wouldn't ask for payment because I don't need payment. I, I, I just want to do it voluntarily just to help someone out in that way. Um, I just, I feel, I don't know what it is. It's this intense, I, I can't describe it. It's just this intense desire to want to, to help and cultivate other people. It's weird. And I, you know, I don't always have this desire. Sometimes I think people are you know, stupid, and I think, oh, why are they doing that, and all the rest of it, like, most of us sometimes think about certain people, but, uh, you know, a lot of the time as well, I have this desire to cultivate people, and to, to make them the best they can be, so, uh, yeah, but I'm not gonna, you know, BS anyone, and say, oh, I'm this saintly person who always wants to help people, and stuff, because it's not the case, you know, sometimes, as I say, people can just get on my nerves like crazy, um, but, anyway, the final uh, point here, I know I've rambled off a little bit there, is identify what mo motivates you and use that as a way to get more work done. So, you know, we all have things that motivate us. We all have things in which um, help us kind of become better at our jobs, become better um, individuals, etc., because of the motivation those things give us. So, I don't necessarily know what this could be. It's obviously going to be different for a variety of different people. Uh, you know, it might be as simple as having a certain treat, you know, uh, maybe going away somewhere or, um, I don't know, watching a certain TV program or doing, you know, just doing something or, I don't know, going on some sort of um, adventure, exercise adventure or activity break or something. I don't know. But find out what motivates you and use it to get more work done. I know, um, actually, a good example of this, I think Ben used the idea of, obviously, he wanted to go to Disneyland and stuff, and that was his motivation. That's always been his motivation, to get back to Disneyland, um, because that's a holiday that he really enjoys. So he uses that, um, and he gets more work done in the process, because he's thinking, well, this work is actually progressively getting closer to something that I actually want to do. And it's not that this work is just in vain or this work is just going to pay bills. It is actually going to something that ultimately I do really want to do. And that kind of idea in your mind, that kind of being able to, to really kind of orient yourself in that goal-oriented goal way of actually getting something that you want is a huge, huge motivation. I mean, it's generally why the species continues, because if we look at it from a uh, a very human sort of sexual point of view, uh, you know, guys like a girl, let's say, 
uh, and and therefore they they want that girl. Let's say they then have that drive that that's their motivation, and so they end up talking to them. They ask them out on a date or whatever, and then hey presto, five years down the line, or maybe even a couple of years down the line, they end up having kids and all the rest of it, and then the species continues. So you could even say that even in that way, you know, you can apply it to a lot of things really. Um, so. Yeah, find what motivates you. Find that that peak of motivation, and uh, and then use that. Use that as strength to to give you more motivation for your work. And obviously, if you enjoy your work anyway, you're not really even going to need much of that motivation because you're just going to enjoy it and, and love what you do. And that was the kind of catalyst I feel for Ben and a lot of other people in the resign community is this combination of enjoyment, a vast enjoyment of what they're doing and a goal um, in which they can focus on, in which they really want to achieve. That combination is deadly, essentially. But when I say deadly, I mean deadly in the positive sense of the word, in the fact that the goal just gets destroyed because of how brilliant they've been able to, to, to do their work and they just smash through the goal and uh, and and just end up um, kind of catapulting their business into a new realm of of efficiency, motivation, productiveness, uh, growth in terms of monetary growth, sales, etc. So when you have that combination of doing what you enjoy anyway and having a goal that you want to enjoy, that is a crazy combination that will allow you to push through to places that you never thought you could get. So this is why I mentioned early on about if you're not enjoying the plan that you've set for yourself, then maybe you need to rework that and go down a route in which you are going to enjoy more because that you really need that enjoyment first off as a base. Um, and then you need that goal that you're going to enjoy as well, because then they're going to really pair up nicely and help you uh, push forward and just enjoy it as well. Just enjoy what you're doing as well. Not not even necessarily pushing forward, but just enjoying it as a natural process of, of, of running your business. So, yeah, that's that's key, really. Um, if you if you don't have that enjoyment, it's going to be a lot harder. It's going to be a lot more of a slog to get to those goals. So. Yeah, identify what motivates you and use that as a way of a way to get more work done. So now we are on to the Instagram comments. So just pulling them up here on Instagram, we've got a couple on the post. I uh, did a little bit of a post on Instagram centered around obviously building a reselling business from the ground up. And I was grateful to get a couple of comments in. So we have Sarah um, and she says, we will be really interested to see this. Um, I would like to know what goals you set yourself in the early months. Now, unfortunately, because the early months were a very long time ago, or quite a long time ago, I've kind of forgot what my goals were. I mean, all the one main goal I had, like we all probably have with this when we start reselling, or, or most of us have with this, not necessarily everyone, but uh, obviously I was going through a... I'm not going to get into this because I've got into it tons in the past but I was going through a hard time with anxiety and so I needed to make this business work because I knew I wouldn't be very good in a full-time position having have having had or having uh, still had anxiety um or still having anxiety I should say um so because of that I knew I wouldn't be very good in a full-time job so there was just this insane motivation to get this business going, to to buy as much as I can, to sell as much as I can, and just get it going. And that was my main goal. And I just had insane motivation because as well when I found Nick on YouTube, it was as though I had found what I wanted to do. It was as though I had found the thing in life that I was really, really motivated for, really, really happy for. And that's not changed. It definitely is something intrinsic in my life. I found as I've matured a little bit that it's not the thing that I want to do forever. I mean, I will, I've always mentioned, I'll always do resign to some extent, but it's never, it's not going to be the thing that I want to do forever. I want to explore other more academic uh 
pursuits essentially as well as resign. I can always imagine me doing resign. Maybe I'll have, you know, there might be a point in my life where I only have 30, 40, 50 items on eBay, something like that. And it's very much a very, very low hobby for me um, because I'm pursuing more, I'd say, other academic areas that I want to pursue. Um, and this may mean slight changes in the YouTube channel, or it might mean that the YouTube channel slows down a little bit. But again, YouTube is something that I always want to do as well, so it's something that I'm not going to neglect entirely. Um, but yeah, so I always kind of wanted to do reselling. That was kind of my, my the thinking at the time. So I just kind of had the natural motivation there to get things done and to, to get things going. Um, so there was a lot of... I don't know how I don't know how to term it. Just generally passion. I'd say passion is the right word. Just in very very intense passion for reselling for what I'm doing. Um, it was yeah, just this incredible incredible vigor um, that I have to do this. I have to do this. And what happened was at the start first few months. I came across a few problems, as most people do, for the first few months of the business. Um, I was having trouble with how do I do my accounting right, and you know, I, I, I was. It took me a very long time, actually, about twelve months, to get my accounting uh, sorted in the way that I wanted to do it in, because I was flipping from different ways of doing my accounting, and I didn't like one way, I and mean, I didn't like the other. And I finally found a, a, a pursuit or a, a way of accounting that I really enjoyed. And I do that to this day. I've done it for three years now or so. And I really enjoy this way of accounting. And it's very, very time efficient. But essentially, um, accounting was, was one of the problems I came across. And also I had some issues with PayPal receiving limits and uh, I think I had some sort of issue with my PayPal being a personal account and I had to go on the phone with PayPal and the people at PayPal weren't very considered and weren't very helping of my situation and I ended up having to ring up about five times over a numerous amount of weeks uh, to get where I wanted to be because I had to keep waiting you see every time I phoned up we said oh well we'll get that sorted for you in the next seven days and then obviously uh, if it's not sorted ring back so I, so every seven days I was having to ring back because they hadn't sorted my account and hadn't done what what needed to be done on my account so I had issues with that I had the normal issues that people have with returns and all the rest of it and there were so many issues that generally I've forgotten a lot of the issues I've, I've had so many issues with my business that as soon as an issue comes forth now what I do um, is I think, right, this is an issue, let's get it sorted. Once it is sorted, that's it, I forget about it. I do not ponder on it or anything. I don't think, oh, thank God that's sorted, and oh, I hope that that never happens again. Or I don't do any of that. I just think to myself, right, that was that problem, done, sorted. Right, you are gone. You're, you're an illusion now. You're in the past. You're You're forgotten. So... That's a good way of looking at it. As I mentioned before, actually, about, you know, future challenges and don't worry about future challenges and stuff. Also, on the same end of that, don't worry about things that have happened in your past. They're gone. They're done, you know. So, essentially, I had a lot of problems. But with with each of these problems, it made me even more determined and passionate to get this off off the ground because I was like, I'm not having people take this away from me. At, at the time now, looking back, it was very, um, I was kind of, because I know a little bit about psychology now, it's kind of like very um, living in my ego and it could even also be determined as a, an ego defense mechanism of some sort because I was protecting myself and my business to such a high degree and I was being very, very determined and all, all this sort of stuff that... Um, you know, obviously, but but then obviously that gave me the the necessary vigor to get through. So sometimes it is worth actually being quite or almost a little bit selfish with regards to your business uh, to be able to get you through the challenges and and become a little bit of an ego, become a little bit of someone who is you know not going to be pushed around a bit. That's kind of what you have to become a little bit more of. I mean, I didn't do. I didn't get to learn Photoshop and get to learn me editing on Premiere Pro and do, you know, get to learn other things about philosophy and little bits about psychology and read, lo you know, read different books and stuff and all the different things that I've done over the past four years, whether it to be, be to do with my business or outside my business. I didn't get to 
doing them and being there without a level of, uh, you know, taking control and being a bit more harsh with people and be, or not necessarily completely harsh, but but just not letting other people kind of bat you down completely. You've got to integrate a little bit, bit of that ego within yourself and think, no, I'm not going to let people push me around and I'm going to I'm going to stand for my corner. But at the same time, when I can and on the most occasions that I can, I'm going to help people. I'm going to help their businesses. I'm going to collaborate with people. I'm going to help them them grow. And, uh, you know, even when I'm doing deals with people, uh, whether it be large halls or whatever, or even just smaller deals, I will try and be as considerate as I can to the other person in the deal. But also I am going to be a little bit, not necessarily quite manipulative, but I'm going to try and wangle it so that then I get a decent deal, you know? So that's how you kind of have to be. And you're not going to get anywhere (laughs) really by just thinking, oh my God, there's all these problems. I'm going to go away and hide away now that's not to say that there hasn't been days for me where I felt like that and that I have actually kind of retreated or regressed a little bit and thought to myself you know what I just can't deal with this today I'm gonna deal with it tomorrow that's fine do that all you want you well not all you want because then that's the only thing you'd ever do but at certain times it might be worth you doing that but you've got to pick yourself back up that's the important thing it's not about for, it's not about um, worrying about getting knocked down, and this is what a lot of people say, actually. It's not about worrying about getting knocked down. It's about being able to pick yourself back up and and, and, and learn from those mistakes and all the rest of it. So, yeah, I wouldn't say, unfortunately, Sarah, I wouldn't say there was specific goals that I had. I just wanted... I mean, of course, I mentioned the fact that I wanted to get to X number of listings and I wanted to make it full-time and stuff, but they're the only two, I I just honed down my goals completely to one main goal of, I want to do this, and uh, and that's all I needed, I only needed, I want to do this, you know, that's the only thing I've ever really needed in whatever pursuit I've had, Uh, I'd say whether it be to do with my business, in terms of my reselling, whether it be to do with my YouTube, whether it be to do with more academic study or reading or whatever, all I've needed to do is have have an insane confidence of, I want to do this, and if I'm interested in it enough, I'll I'll do it, and I don't have any I don't have any lack or uh, l- lack of confidence in myself uh, in that way. I just I literally just if I've got the um, inspiration, if I've got the interest, uh, and I can say quite genuinely and sincerely, I want to do this, then I'll do it. You know, and and that's that. You know, and and that's and that's essentially how it is in life. You know, people will tell you that. Uh, you can kind of get to places without, um, I I suppose some people will tell you you can get to places without needing a bit of a struggle, but there is going to be that there, you know, I mean, it depends to what degree you let it affect you, I suppose. There's always going to be the struggle there. There's always going to be this kind of fight there that you need to partake in, but you don't necessarily need to let that affect you. You can remove yourself a little bit from it and realize that the business's problems aren't your problems. Uh, You know, they're just the business's problems, essentially. And then obviously, they are your problems in a sense, because you've got to deal with them. But you also need that degree of separation. Because if you're completely saying that these problems define who you are, then that's going to make you incredibly anxious, incredibly down, all the rest of it. Instead, recognize the business's problems, deal with them, but deal with them in a frame of mind of business, of a business frame of mind opposed to a personal frame of mind. If you if you're struggling in a relationship, let's say, then that's a personal problem. It doesn't need to impact your business, just as your business problems doesn't need to impact your personal life or your sense of happiness within yourself. So that's what I'm talking about, about this degree of separation. Of course, the business's problems need to be your problems to a degree because it's your business, but it's about this kind of cutting off, this kind of cut off point of saying, well, yeah, they are my problems, but I'm only going to deal with them um, as such within the confines of my business. And then I'm going to cut myself off from those problems. And then I'm going to live happy inside myself 
for the other part of my existence, essentially. So, yeah, that's what I would say with regards to that one. Uh, I know I was kind of rambling quite a lot there, but I kind of wanted to get a few different bits and bobs out with that. Um, so next we've got the Wicked Kitty. Uh, she says, uh, she just basically um, is saying a tip here. Uh, start with selling your own stuff to get comfortable with the process and to see what sells. Don't just rush out and buy random stuff as I did. Um, I sold half the stuff from my first haul, took two years and made a loss of five pound. The rest I gave up as bad job. Wow, so yeah, that is a good one. So start with selling your own stuff first. Uh, that's always pretty good. Did I do that? I don't know whether I did that or not. I can't, I can't remember, but it is a good tip. It is a good tip no matter what, whether I did it or not. I, I definitely know that's a good tip. Um, because then it gets you familiar with the eBay platform. So if you, let's say, have... Um, if you jump in and you go to a car boot or charity shop or auction and you buy a lot of stuff and then you list it on eBay, those first listings are going to be very hit or miss. They're not going to be very brilliant listings. Whereas if you started to just sell your own items with no financial cost going into them or anything, then... You can have you can gain gain an idea of whether this is for you or not, and because you're selling your own items, you don't need to register straight away with HMRC because you're not buying something to sell on for a profit. They're just your personal items. So let's say you take two weeks or a month of selling your own items. If you don't like it, if it's not for you, then you don't need to register with HMRC. You don't need to do anything like that because you've not bought anything with the intention to resell or to make a profit on. Um, so therefore, you can just close it down. You can just think, right, well, sold some of my own items. It's not for me. I'll chuck it in the bin. Fair enough, right? And that's that. Um, so that's a good way of doing it because obviously it means you don't have to commit to starting a business straight away. Um, but also, as I say, it gets you familiar with the platform and it means that if you do want to go on to actually do reselling as a, as a stronger force in your life, as a stronger part of your life, as an actual business, then you can obviously use those uh, things that you're selling of your own to develop and cultivate skills with listing on eBay, with doing better photographs, with learning the keywords, with learning how to price things in line with eBay completed and sold listings. So just generally get familiar with the eBay platform. So I would definitely say that, um, yeah, that you start with your own items and start, fairly quickly you know if you have the idea and you think that it's a decent idea don't ponder on it for too long don't think oh well should i do it shouldn't i do it should i do it shouldn't i do it just go in for it think to yourself right you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna give this a go because it doesn't matter it makes no odds if if i don't want to do it i'm just gonna get it get it started see what happens and uh, if i don't like it then i don't have to do it if i really do like it then, you know, after a couple of weeks, after two, three, four weeks or whatever, of learning a little bit with your own items, you can go out there and you can start buying stuff to resell. And then what you want to do is obviously register with HMRC ASAP as soon as possible. I think, I believe now, of course, I've never, I've not registered a business for, well, four years. So, um, or just over four years. So I don't know whether this will have changed but when I registered a business, you needed to register your business within three months of trading. So if you don't do that, I think you get a penalty. And then if you if you leave it for a very long time, you might get something even more than, severe than a penalty. So make sure that in that first three months of trading, or you might want to do a bit of research uh, of this uh, by yourself because it might have changed over the last four years. As I say, register within that three months of trading. And, and what you need to do is as soon as you buy an item that with the intention to sell it on, you need to be registering at that point, really, uh, because that is then a business, especially if you're then listing that item on eBay and actually selling it. You need to then register straight away and, and just get it done. Don't don't register two months in or anything just even though you have got the three month limit or at least i believe you've got the three month limit um register from a few days in you know as soon as you've done that as soon as you've gone to your first auction or your your first car boot register straight away don't get it don't, don't wait and as i say 
in that eBay courses playlist, I've got a video walking you through the process of registering a business in the UK, in the UK. so you really don't need to worry, it's not a hard process and I can take you by the hand through most of it. There is a part in the video where I can't actually uh, go with you through the process because it meant that I would have to register a new business myself to do that part of the process. So I'm not completely with you all the way, but I do explain part of that that missing process in the video anyway. So it is a pretty decent video and there's not many tutorials on that video centered around that topic on YouTube. So yeah, definitely give that a watch. Um, and, and, you know, if you're worried about, oh, well, I don't know how to set up a business or it's probably going to be really, really hard or the rest of it. It's not that hard. It's pretty it's pretty easy to be honest, and then you'll get your UTR in the post, um, uh, which is un un your unique tax reference, and then obviously that means that you are registered for self-assessment and you can do your tax returns and all the rest of it. So with that being said, we will leave it there. We are on one hour fifteen minutes, so that's not too bad. Uh, been quite a good one today. We've got plenty covered. Um, if you think that this was a pretty decent podcast, and you have people in your life that are uh, wanting to do reselling or wanting to get involved with reselling um, and you think that this podcast specifically might just give them a bit of information on maybe how they could start a reselling business and, and building it from the ground up and some tips and stuff, then please do share it with those people. Um, also, you can share the reselling courses, uh, you can share the playlist or share an individual video in the, in the reselling courses. Um, playlist to those people as well because that's what I'm trying to do I'm trying to create um, you know plenty of videos and I have done oh, this year in particular I've been very much focused on trying to create more videos that actually help people whether it be new resellers or existing resellers to essentially uh, just see their business in a new light and, and to give them a few tips for things and to be able to help them through the challenges of reselling and stuff. So I would very much appreciate it if you would share some of the videos if you do have new new resellers in your life. As always, like the video if you do like it and subscribe if you haven't already subscribed to the channel. Finally, all there is left for me to say is that next week's topic, once again, is going to be covering backlogs, sticky stock and an optimum inventory. So with that being said, drop your comments down below or over on my Instagram account uh, with that topic in mind. Of course, I will do a communi community tab post as I always do, as well as an Instagram post later on next week, probably, uh, well, sorry, no, actually this week because it's last week for me, isn't it? But when you're watching this podcast, it'll be next week. So I will do those posts actually probably on the day or the day after you're watching this podcast now uh, if you're watching it on the day of upload. So, yeah, with that being said, thank you very much, guys, and I will see you in the next one.